speakers will speak for about 10 minutes each and then we open it up and everybody can chip in and get a discussion going, okay? Hey folks, thanks for coming along. Uh, just to say, I had start, I was going to start today with a wee introduction about today's uh, Irish Times news headline about, uh, you know, they're flying another political kite 11 months after Irish water became law and the charges, we still don't know how much we're actually going to be forced to pay uh, if the government get their way. But I was just alerted to the fact that today in Talla, uh, the tallest, uh, John Burton, has been blocked by, Irish war, uh, by water charge protesters for over two hours now. <laughs> yes. The, there's a Garda helicopter monitoring the situation. And, there is, and the public order unit is on site as well. But for two hours, they've been baby stepped. John Burton's been baby stepped out of the area, which has become a common feature, uh, particularly on the north side of Dublin, uh, in relation to the installation of the water meters, where uh, residents uh, and supporters have come out in massive numbers to block the installation of the water meters. But I just wanted to start, uh, I'll get back to that, don't worry, you can keep your reviews for them. But uh, just to say, there's a few events that I think are important to highlight. Uh, about a month ago, uh, three weeks into October, GMC Sierra were in the High Court for the second time, as it was at the time. And when senior counsel for uh, the company, who are the main installers of water meters for Irish water in Dublin City, when the senior counsel, it's a Finna Fall counsel by the name of Jim O'Callaghan, when he had hauled another group of eight residents up into the High Court to try and jump them, to prevent them from resisting the installation of the water meters, he alerted the, ju uh, the judge to the fact that he was also applying for a 20 metre exclusion zone. Right? And the minute he mentioned his application for a 20 metre exclusion zone, the court erupted in laughter, in absolute and utter spontaneous laughter. And Derva MacDonald, who's the Irish Independent Legal Affairs Correspondent, uh, tweeted that she's never seen a courthouse as packed as it was that day, and she's never seen such a, re a reaction in a, in a high court. And she goes, this court actually toppled the government because there was over 100 uh, water charges protesters in the court that day. And it was just the, the, the level of dismissiveness. It was like, you can go to the high court, you can get your injunctions, you can spend 100 grand each and every time, you know, gaining your access to these courts to, to try and break the resistance of the, uh, the water charge and the water meter resi uh, resistors, but it ain't gonna work. And it's pretty amazing to see it. Uh, like just the, the level of contempt people have now for everything uh, related to Irish water is, is fantastic to behold because we are, I think it's safe to say, and Richard will probably touch on this in more detail, but we are in the midst of a nationwide revolt against the water charges. I don't think this has been seen for decades. There's hundreds of thousands of people, uh, 100,000 on the 11th of October, 200,000 took to the streets on the 1st of November uh, in 100 areas, 106 localities across the country. But just in my own area, a specific area on the north side of Dublin, uh, the area I represent, uh, just in the lead up to the 1st of November, there was a big debate about local activity versus a city centre based event. And a um, few of them, about three or four people decided actually we'll go for a midweek, the 29th of uh, October, it was a midweek, it was a Wednesday. They thought we'd have a march through Kilmore and Kilrock. Uh, at seven o'clock. Now, some of the politicals involved in that area, including myself, thought it was a mad idea. We thought, this is crazy. You've only three days notice. You won't be able to get the leaflets out in time. It's gonna go on Facebook, yeah, but what does that matter? What does that really achieve? And on the Wednesday night, 400 people turned up, 400 angry, militant people in the pissings rain turned up and marched together as one. They went down the Malahide Road and when the passing traffic going up the other way saw what the, the protest was about, the horns were beeping left, right and centre. It was unbelievable. Prime time were there recording it. And when we stopped outside the Kirloch Garden station, uh, there was about 10 minutes of just chanting, shame, 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 for the political policing that was, has been in evidence across the north side over the past six months. And I just think that I, I'm learning lessons as I go along. The militancy and the anger that's out there amongst the people. Because not only has there been a war waged against communities in Cork and elsewhere across the country, and particularly in the north side of Dublin over the past six months, but for the past six years in this country, we've had just relentless austerity. Cutback after cutback after cutback. To the point where Richard mentioned it yesterday, Credit Suisse came out with their wealth report uh, last month. And in a country the size of, what, 4.2 million people, we have, not only do we have five billionaires, 
but we've 90,000 millionaires. 90,000 millionaires in a country that has 1.23 million people living in poverty. 1.23 million people living in poverty. That's one in four living in poverty. The UNICEF came out last month to say that actually uh, Irish families with children have lost 10 years of income progress over the past six years. And an additional net increase of 130,000 children are now living in poverty due to the austerity policies of successive governments, Fianna Fáil, the Greens, uh, Fine Gael and Labour. And I think that brewing discontent that we have seen over the past six years, and it hasn't really had a chance to manifest itself in an organised, really nationwide fashion. That's what we're saying now. There was all these individual struggles, and there was. Irish people, people in this country did fight on different specific issues, local issues like a &E closures, home health uh, courts, a million hours back in 2012 in court. There were many different issues, welfare being caught, uh, the prescription charge going up, uh, the metal card issue too. Lots of different, you know, disparate struggles, but we were never able or we were never strong enough to link them all together. But with water, it's different. It's a fundamental human need that links every single one of us. And the government's attempt to try to commodify and ultimately privatise a basic human right is what's seen the biggest mass movement on the streets for some 30 years. Some say since the conscription crisis of 1918, not too sure, but it's, it's one of the biggest mass movements that we're currently involved in. And I think that's why, because in a country that has 90,000 millionaires, that has one in four people living in, in poverty, in dire poverty, you know, the, 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 the level of anger that has now been expressed is logical. It's, it's, you know, it's, an, it's a logical outflow of uh, all those cutbacks. And we are now seeing a grassroots, uh, organic, and I know Kay's going to talk about this, uh, campaign in communities right across the country because I think that was reflected on the 11th of October when 100,000 people turned up. Firstly, nobody expected that number of people to turn up because the route itself that Right to Water had actually organised was too short. You know, it wouldn't have fit everyone if they had just turned up and stood there. There wasn't enough space along the entire route. So that they actually extended uh, around by Dal Aaron up to Stevens Green and around George Street. I think they went down into Wicklow and Wexford at one point <laughs> and back up around. You know, it was massive. And that has politically, that, that has tr transformed the whole situation because in the lead up to the day of nationwide local protests on the 1st of November, a very, 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 very peculiar, and I mean, unbelievably strange and a bit disconcerting thing happened in the media that week. Morning Ireland every day of the week talked about the people. They talked about the protests, the upcoming protests on the Saturday, on the 1st of November, as if the people were now a part of the equation, were a factor, right? Because normally when the media, political journalists, uh, spin doctors, <coughs> government ministers are talking about the politics with a capital B in this country, it's all about, you know, what this party did, what she said, what he said. Now, the people, because of the 100,000, because of the 11th of October, the people are now the determining factor in what happens with the water changes. And it was amazing to see it, it really was, and to hear it, and to actually go, yes, we do have the power. When we come together in massive numbers, like we did on the 11th and again on the 1st, we, we do have control. We can actually determine what happens in this country. So, uh, I won't go on too much longer, but just to say, it is, like, I am learning lessons, because you go along and you see it, and you think uh, some things won't work, some things uh, seem a bit crazy, like that midweek march, and it turns out, like, the end of it, the culmination of that march, in the torrential rain in the car park of Northland uh, shopping centre was that a big barrel was uh, taken out of somebody's boot which was loaned to her from the local scouts group uh, and they all poured in their application packs and we had a bonfire of the utilities and just, and then again <laughs> I think what that reflects though is uh, the lady who actually got that barrel uh, from, you know, the scouts, she took it upon herself to think, okay, well, we're going there, we're talking about burning utilities, so, okay, we have to be practical here, like, well, what do we need? She went to the scouts, or local scouts group, and she got this big barrel. Fantastic. Uh, what Kay's going to talk about is practical issues, like how do we organise resistance in our, in our own areas? And this is, these are discussions we have to have, because this is us now determining the future of this country, as people come together, democratically discussing and deciding what do we do, how best can we now defeat the water challenges, see the abolition of Irish water and the topping of this government. Because it's a real, it's a very real possibility that we have in front of us. 
And I think that's a discussion we need to have now because there's no guarantees. They'll come out with carrots and sticks over the next week or two. They'll say, yeah, we're gonna cap it at 200, <laughs> but you know, if you don't register and if you don't pay, you know, you're gonna end up in court. Or they're, they're even frying a kite with the revenue permission. They're doing all sorts of things to frighten people. But if we can build over the next few weeks a name to make the 10th of December, which is the big, uh, the next big national demonstration, which is on a Wednesday, uh, what we're hoping is that it's a stay away and siege day where we're hoping people will, you know, take a dinner on a half day, whatever it is that needs to be decided locally to ensure that we have tens of thousands surrounding that cesspit and not leaving until they abolish the water charges. It's already started. Mm. It has begun. And I tell you, the evidence is out there for it now. You look at the communities that are joining together, and we're all joining together. Just to give you an example of evidence of how I know the revolution has begun, I have people now standing on the corner with me at 7 o'clock in the morning that used to watch Coronation Street, and the talk is about a real report. People are watching now so closely, everything and anything. It's actually bigger than water. It has become a lot bigger than water has. To start back um, in late April, seven months ago, Irish water just appeared one day with no notice and they happened to pick on the wrong house. Now, it could have been any of the other people that stand with me, it just happened to be mine. <laughs> I ran out, a bit like a lunatic, not even dressed, and jumped in with a digger <laughs> because I felt that was the thing to do. I'm not advising anyone else to do that, but while I put out a call for help, I just felt I could delay things. And people came. The women across the road parked their cars over the shores and all ran over to me, letting me go in to get dressed and put a call out for help, because it's not a pretty sight. Um, people came, um, and it was decided... We didn't know what we were doing, to be honest with you. We just, I knew I didn't want to meet her, and neither did those people. So it was best decided that we would stand in with the digger because if the digger couldn't move, they couldn't dig any more holes. They could console away and draw pictures around the shores. Great stuff. But if you can't move the digger, then you can't give me a meter. A standoff ensued um, till half five that night and no meters were put in that day. Um, I went home, I printed up leaflets and I ran around the whole estate that night till 11 o'clock knocking on doors. A bit like a mad woman and telling people Irish water are here you know, do you want to meet her? Are we going to make a stand? And I said, look, let's meet at the lights at seven o'clock in the morning and went home and prayed I wasn't the only one standing there. <laughs> to my utter amazement, the next morning over 50 people turned up to stand there. <laughs> Our plan of action was, we live in a state with one entrance in and one entrance out. So the idea was, we would hold them at the lights. We weren't going to let them in at all. So this is what we did. The only truck we let in the next day was the one that was going to cement the packs back to the way they were with no meters in. We walked, some of us walked them down, we watched them as they did it, and then we escorted them out. Our plan of action then was that we would stand at the lights. And they have tried to hit us several times over the last few months. And once or twice they did get in, and we asked, we approached the foreman and said, can we refuse a meter? Because in the 2013 Water Act, nowhere does it state you have to have a meter. They cannot meter every house and apartment block in Ireland because it's not possible for some houses. So while it does acknowledge Irish water, it does acknowledge that you're supposed to pay for it, it doesn't say you have to have a meter. So we did not want a meter. Um, by um, August, uh, the police started to come with the Irish water workers because the north side of Dublin started to organise and we were quite successful in holding them off. Um, they did get a couple of metres in, they were people who wanted them. And we've no issue with anybody who wants a metre. That's fine, you can have one. But we're there to support and stand with the people who don't want a metre because they feel this is a very unjust charge. We felt the metering was a precursor to privatisation, yeah. as has happened in many countries. When the IMF come in, they, they, they go on an asset grab. So they grab any country's natural resources or any assets and they try to privatise it. And they take it out of ordinary people's reach. We can see this with the property at the moment, the, the foreign investment buying all the apartments and houses, yeah. pushing rental um, up. So a lot of people have been pushed out and becoming homeless. This will happen in the water. Look at Detroit, over 200,000 people cut off um, according to affordability. This is not going to happen in Ireland, not on our watch. It's our turn to stand up. As I said, by late August, 
the police started escorting Irish Water in and acting as a private security company for Irish Water. There is a video from Airfield when the police came one day and we decided we were walking across the lights and we wouldn't let Irish Water in. We had over 40 guard to come, park up on the main road and they went straight for us. Now at that point, we were just crossing the road like pedestrians. They went for one of our elderly women first. I don't think she'd like me saying that, I better retract that. Um, she, she's in her uh, 50s. Um, I've just dug a hole and dug a bigger hole. Um, and he grabbed her and he swung her around the place. So much so that her whole arm was bruised. They then came along behind us and pushed and shoved us. They um, called us all sorts of names. We walked slowly. We couldn't prevent them getting in because the Garda public order units were there. And as we walked in front of the trucks, the Garda went between us and the trucks. And where you couldn't see on the video was they clenched their fists and pushed them into the bottom of our backs, telling us that we needed to move. We were insulted. We were told to go home and clean our house, get a job. Um, there was a lot of bad language used as well. We were throwing our hands in the air going, we're peaceful protesters. Um, we didn't know what to do then, so we did the hokey pokey. Oh, yeah. um, we felt that was a peaceful response, and how could you try and beat up people who are singing the hokey pokey? It just doesn't. You know. We also sang some other ridiculous songs at the time and did some dances too in a circle in front of the bands. Uh, the guard soon got fed up with us. And rather than let Irish Water come into the state to do a U-turn, to turn around and get back out, they held up traffic as far back as the Malahide Road while they made them do reverse out of the estate. And as they reversed out, we all stood there. It, we, it really felt good. But they've come back at us again and again, into more estates, into Dunamead. The five main areas, or the areas they're hitting now is Dublin 5, 9 and 13. Airfield, Edenmore, Dunamead, Limewood. We don't know why they have this bit between their teeth that they feel that they need to come back at us again and again. We actually know where Irish Water are going because we watch Kulak Guard Station and as soon as we see the 30 and 40 guards coming up, we follow the guards and we know where Irish Water are going. <laughs> so that is the solution that we have come up with. Um, in addition to that, there's people on the N32 and they drive around in their cars. We are in communications. There is back panel, back channels of communications. Um, we have pages set up, so most areas now have their own anti-water metering and charges page set up. I would urge you to, if you're on Facebook or social media, to have a look at that. Yeah. We've set up an early morning text alert, so in your own community, if you have a meeting, people will give their numbers. My first port of call it, when they come is the early morning text alert. It's my residents that can get to me quicker than I put on the page. They're here, help, because we're doing this under duress, because at this point we've guards and Irish water, and we are struggling then to get the message out. And people have come from Kilmore, Coolock, we've had people from Navan, we've had people from Balbriggan, Swords, all come to help us. What no one understands, or at least the elites, the political elites, don't understand at the moment, and what they're, what they're just not getting, they really are, is this is a people's movement. And we are coming to help each other. And we will continue to do that. And where I didn't know people on my estate six months ago, I drove in and out and quite lazy. I would go to work, see my friends, do whatever I was doing. The people I know stand at the lights with seven months later are my friends, and I'll go to the wall for them. And they will go to the wall for me too. So while you may feel a bit odd standing up there in your estate on your own, you're not going to be on your own for long. These people will become your friends. And you will work together to stop Irish water. It's, it's amazing the community's coming together. We are now being fed at the lights for dissidents, and we, we think we need to put up a sign saying, don't feed the dissidents. We're getting chocolate cakes and six pack of crisps thrown out windows at us. And, um, an example of community spirit the other day, a Brennan's bread van. We drove up, we pulled in just down from the lights from us, said nothing, got out with a big bread board of bread. Here you go, girls, make the sandwiches. I mean, what is amazing the community spirit that is coming out there. Last night I had a man knock up to me door. He was the admin from down there, and he had breadboards made for Airfield with, with signs. Wouldn't take any money from them. He said, "No, I support. Just go ahead." Yesterday morning at the lights, we're having a benefit night on the 21st of November in the Airfield Club. It's a tenner in. The reason why we're having this is we've set up a national defence fund for those who are having injunctions placed upon them for actually peacefully protesting. Now we're the peaceful protesters. It's the guards that are bringing it to us, bringing in public order units to our areas. 
So, so far 19 people have injunctions served against them. Of that 19, nine have taken no written undertaking that they won't peacefully protest. It was broken on Monday and Tuesday in Dunamid. And the reason why it was broken was because they set up along four houses. She came out and wanted the meters, no problem. An elderly gentleman came out and said, I don't want a meter. He invited us all into our garden, into his garden actually, should I say. We stood in the garden with him. He called the foreman over, I don't want a meter. Garden starts sprouting, you have to have a meter, it's the law. We said in the 2013 Water Act, it doesn't say he has to have a meter and he's not getting one. The guard instructed the fella on the Kango hammer to start going ahead and uh, digging the hole to put the meter in. In which case, we said to the elderly gentleman, what do you want us to do? The elderly gentleman then tried to pull the barriers to get inside, to stop it, and once we seen that he was going to get inside, we all jumped the barriers. Um, so the injunction was broken. But if we do this in numbers, they can't arrest us all and they can't imprison us all. It's not possible. Now, some of them who are in the courts are back up in the High Court on Wednesday. Uh, the courts are looking for committal orders against them because they've broken the injunction several times. Um, just to explain to you, and I've probably gone over my time, but the Wednesday before last, a big kickoff happened. Um, Enda Kenny went to Santry. Yes. And at the same time, uh, there was 10 people, the Cameron 10 they're called, were up in the High Courts. I myself was in the High Court to see what was being said. Enda Kenny went to Santry. A lot of my people went up to Santry and they sat on the ground in front of his car. And the guards came in extremely very heavy-handed and threw them about the place like rag dolls. These are mainly women. Men, women seem to have more time. It's, it, no offence to the men, but it seems to be a bit more of a women's movement. More women work part-time or are there at the home looking after their kids, so there is more women involved. They threw the women about like rag dolls, and Enda Kenny was looking out the window of his car with his thumbs up. He seemed to think this was an amusing thing, that Irish citizens were being strung around the place. Yeah. Um, because of the brutal treatment of these women in Santry, it was decided that there would be a march on Kulak Garda station that night. And so over, I would say about two to three hundred people turned up at Kulak Garda station and they were shouting, shame, shame, shame on you. In the crowd, um, plain clothes Garda mixed in with the crowd. They were trying to incite them because, you see, they don't know what to do with peaceful protesters. Yeah. If you're doing the hokey pokey and singing, they don't know what to do with you. Yeah. But they need you to answer back or fight back. Then they know what yeah. to do. That's what they're trained for. Yeah. They're clueless if you have women in front of them singing which side I is on by and looking at them. They, they just don't know what to do with us. They mixed in with the crowd. They got very threatening and they pepper sprayed some of the women. And this was plain clothes guard. The drug unit turned up and there's videos on YouTube of the drug squad actually standing there in Kulak saying they couldn't do their job because they had to be there protecting Kulak Garda station. No one made any attempt to get into the station. And obviously, we're a movement like this, it's so loose and so many people, there will be different groups who will have their agenda joining in. Our response to that is to isolate them, stand to the side and say, we are a peaceful movement. We will never move from being peaceful yeah. because we will win this being peaceful. It's the only way. Sorry, I, I've taken up loads and loads of time here, sorry. So what you can do on your estates is uh, start up your community meetings, start talking to them, set up your text alert, look at your page. Um, look, try to cover the entrances of, it, of your estate, delay or prevent water metering, it's a big part of it. Take part in the boycott, don't pay. Burn your packs, don't send them back. Um, there's also other boycotts going on at the moment, boycott towpaths. As we speak, there's a massive protest going on on Talbot Street outside the independent newspaper offices for their misinformation and their misreporting of uh, events <laughs> that have gone on. And hating the ordinary people as dissidents. We are not. We are the ordinary people of Ireland and we've had enough. So if we stand together, we'll win and I will leave you with that before I'm pulled off. <laughs>
because the stakes, in my opinion, could not be higher. Um, we can, I think, for a moment, reflect on our uh, achievements over the last few months uh, because they can buoy us up uh, and remind us, I suppose, about the potential we have, uh, the, the, the power of the people uh, has achieved wonders already in the last few months. I mean, it's brought home for me just in very simple things, like walking across town at nine o'clock this morning, and I was stopped by three people, town is quiet on a Saturday morning, three people, ordinary working class people, just going about their business, stopping me and saying, when's the next protest? Uh, do you think many of you be out? Uh, what do you think we have to do in our area to get people out for the protest on December the 10th? Uh, will you go into the doll and tell Joe Burton she's an arrogant cow? Uh, and just to see that happening, because it wasn't happening three or four months ago, that everybody you meet... I was in the bank yesterday, I have to confess. I, do, I, I was in the bank and a woman... It seemed like, sort of, from a middle class background, or, you know, apparently middle class uh, background, turned around to me when I was in the queue and she said, did you see that ad for the 1916 Rising that the government had put out? It's a flippin' disgrace. <laughs> the Rising was a revolution, and it, this thing is like a board fault ad, right? <laughs> and she went on to say how what they should be commemorating is the Rising and the Revolution and its relevance uh, to today. So that's what's going on. The people are rising up uh, and uh, they are talking about how they are going to influence the future of their society. Uh, so this is the best of all possible situations uh, and the government are terrified of it. Absolutely terrified. They are at sixes and sevens, uh, flying kites like they've gone out of fashion. Uh, why? in a desperate attempt to see what can fly, what can they get away with, because they're in a serious corner and they know it. Uh, the last roll of the dice is this week. Uh, whatever they come out with, if it can't defuse the protests, they are in deep trouble and they know it. Uh, but how deep that trouble is, because we know what they're going to offer is not what the people have asked for, it's not clarification, it's not allowances, it's not tax credits, or whatever combination of uh, tomfoolery or contracts they uh, come up with, it's the abolition of the charges, and indeed, and indeed, a lot more, as Kay and others have said. It's about a lot more now. It's not just about the water, as sickening as it is that they would try and steal the thing that is necessary for human existence. But it's everything. It's everything they have done to people. Six years of unfairness, of cruelty, of injustice, uh, of uh, being battered. Uh, the people have said, enough is enough. Uh, but when they uh, defeat water charges, I have no doubt that they will uh, want to undo all of that six years of injustice and indeed fight for a society where that kind of injustice can never happen again uh, and where the wealth that exists in our society is shared out uh, in, a fair, uh, in a fair and equal way. Uh, that is the genie that is out of the bottle now and those are the stakes uh, that, we are, uh, that we are fighting for. But it is very important to say that it is in our hands and that's also a heavy responsibility. Uh, because we have to answer them decisively uh, when they come out with whatever they come out with this week. Uh, they will be hoping, as Michael Noonan said, before the demonstrations on November the 1st, that that was the last, what did he call it, the last rally of the anti-water charges uh, struggle. That's what they're going to hope for. What? He said, protest come and protest, protest come. come and We're protest come. Anywhere. And that's what they're relying on. That's what they're hoping for. And they will use uh, their influence in the media. They will use their uh, provocateurs in the movement. Uh, they will use the uh, treacherous leaders of uh, some of the unions, whatever it might be. 
uh, to try and undermine us and divide us and sap our confidence and our will uh, over the next uh, number of weeks. So we have to make sure that that doesn't happen and that we answer them absolutely decisively on December the 10th by surrounding that door with tens and tens and tens of thousands uh, of people and bring them down. And that is what has to be done because it's clear they're not going to give us what we asked for. So to defeat the water charges, we have to bring the government down. Yes. That's the <laughs> I just want to say in conclusion that in order for that to happen, and that is possible, it's not, uh, it's not a nice idea, it is eminently possible, and they know this, we have to go back now and organise in a very, very serious way after this weekend. In one of the great achievements of the November the 1st demonstration, and I know there was debates and arguments, was it a good idea to have local demonstrations, some people felt after having 100,000 on the streets, we should go back to Dublin again. And I understand that because they thought maybe it'll be weaker if we have lots of small demonstrations. But it proved to be right because we doubled the numbers of people on the streets. Uh, we showed that we could uh, escalate the movement to a new level. And most important, uh, there are now 106, that's the, the number and it's rising daily, there were 106 places across the country that organized demonstrations. Right? <laughs> Now, those 106 areas provide the basis to bring this government down. Yeah. That's organisation in 106 places. But those 106 places have to get themselves organised. They can't sit back on their laurels of having done something fantastic on November the 1st. We have to have mass assemblies in the next two weeks in all of those areas where the hundreds of people or the thousands of people who came together on November the 1st gather together and discuss how are we going to get people to walk out of work on December uh, the 10th? Uh, how are we going to get them to take days off work? How many buses are we going to book uh, to make the banners, to make the placards, to mobilise their community, the workplaces, every layer of society, students, pensioners, the disabled, every group has to be contacted, systematic work. Uh, to pull the tens of and hundreds of thousands we need on December the 10th. So we will be important for that. These things do not happen by themselves. People have to go out and fight and give out the leaflets and get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. That's how it happens. Uh, so that is the task uh, that, that uh, uh, we have if we are going to bring them down. It is possible. The prize is there for us. We, we are going to have to work relentlessly for the next few weeks to do it. And the very final point I want to make is this. And we seriously have to ask us and I, I, ourselves this question, because uh, you know politics has, for understandable reasons, become a bad word. Such has been the rottenness of the political establishment in this country. Their self-serving, corrupt, personal ambition, motives, and all that sort of stuff. That politics has become, understandably, a bad word. But it seems to me. We have to recover politics and political organisation for the people. And why do I say that? Because if we bring the government down, then the next question is who's going to be the government? Yeah. Right? And we have to have an answer to that question. Yeah. Now to me that's not just about how many people we get into the rotten uh, building that is Dáil Éireann, but it is about a new type of democracy that is based on the sort of assemblies we're seeing in Kulak, and the assemblies that we saw on the streets on November the 1st, and making institutions of permanent, popular, direct, participatory democracy the length and breadth of the country. Yeah. But in order to fight for that, we, we need to go out and fight for that vision. Because if we do bring the government, they will try and channel the debate back into the narrow political parameters of is it Fianna Fáil or is it Fianna Gael or will you be a minority party backing one or other of these. That's no good to us. Even if we defeat the water charges, we'll be back to square one in six months. Yeah. We would need a much more fundamental change than that, which means organising institutions that make permanent the power of the people uh, in determining the political future of this country. And to do it, that is what we are committed to in the SWP and People Before Profit. To link together the people who say, we are never going back. Now that the people are off their knees, we are never going back. 
We want a, a democracy and a society based on the power of working people. That is the stakes we're fighting for, and we want you to join us in that project. Yeah. <laughs>